Snowball Spark. You want good words? Data languages. Talk real sports with a real man. Come after me. I'm a man. I'm 40. And now, here's the be-all, end-all, know-it-all of high school, college, and pro sports. Aaron Skinny Count with The Skinny on Sports. We're talking about practice, man. I'm the MVP. Good Thursday morning out there, Western Oklahoma. Welcome to the Skinny on Sports right here on 98.1 FM. The Sports Animal, glad to have you along for the next hour. No Jared today, he's feeling under the weather, so it's just me and just you. And so this would be a perfect opportunity. If there's something on your mind that you want to discuss, feel free, call in 225-9698 or text me 225-9698. If there's some topic you want to discuss, feel free to chime right in with questions or comments or whatever you have there on the text line or on the phone line, 225-9698. We've got all kinds of things happening. The NBA season getting started. You've got the World Series beginning tomorrow. High school football, college football, the NFL back at it tonight. So we've got all kinds of different options out on the table this morning, 225 96 Nine, eight. What I've got on my rundown, uh, NFL toward the end of the show. Of course, Baker is in Buffalo tonight. The, the uh, Bucks facing off against the Bills. Bucks have lost two in a row after that hot start at 3-1, three and one, even 3-3 three and three now. Maybe coming back down to earth a little bit there in the AFC South. Some big games on the docket this week in the NFL. Jacksonville at Pittsburgh. you got the Rams at Dallas. Cleveland at Seattle. I don't know if anybody had that one pegged before the season as uh, one of the marquee games of the week but it certainly is and then Cincinnati traveling to San Francisco Deshaun Watson in that Cleveland game not available that was announced yesterday what what's the deal with is he done is this is this everybody wants to be on the side of the players right now in in basically everything but is this the reason why you don't see the NFL owners guaranteeing contracts the way that this one was now all of a sudden Deshaun Watson not playing Ben Simmons-esque in my mind, with Deshaun. Also, trade deadline coming up. Big names out there. Will anything actually happen? Saquon Barkley, rumored to be on the move. Is Derrick Henry on the trading block? Titans traded Keith Byers yesterday to to, uh, the Eagles. Are they looking for a fire sale? Broncos feel poised for a fire sale. So uh, lots of NFL topics to talk about. Uh, Some big games coming up in college football this weekend, but more importantly, I think the biggest story in college football now is off the field and that is what exactly has been going on at Michigan what has Jim Harbaugh been allowing to happen does anybody really believe he doesn't know what's been happening he's completely isolated from uh from Connor Stallions do we really believe that just the there's a whole ball of wax there that what happens I think that's the more interesting thing He's caught. Michigan's caught doing something that is illegal in the rule book. Now, what should happen to him? What can happen to him? Is it this year? Is it down the road? There's a lot to unpack there. And, of course, the big games. And then NBA, man, Thunder were good last night. Woo. 82 No, Does anybody have any idea what the uh, what the parade route's going to be in downtown Oklahoma City for a title? They're starting etching that out. I'm just teasing. But they were very good. Not good sign for Billy Donovan. Already a players-only meeting after game one. Could be the end of the road for him. <clears throat> Christoph Porzingis, we mentioned him. him yesterday as a reason why both Jared and I like the Celtics. He uh, did something nobody's ever done in a Celtic uniform, which is hard to say. It's a lot. That's a mouthful to say. Victor Wimbanyama made his debut. It was maybe more about another guy, just reminding everybody he's still pretty good. And then Dame will, de- uh, will debut tonight in Milwaukee. And then the World Series stuff. We asked the question, how long has it been since it's, since a World Series kind of this surprising with both teams? I found the answer. I found the answer to the last time. So the Rangers were 50-1 to one in the preseason to win the World Series. The Diamondbacks were 125-1. to one. And I found the answer to the last time the odds were that, were that uh, great for teams to make it into the World Series. Let's see if we can figure that one out. 225-9698 is the phone or the text line. That is 225-9698. Give us a call, shoot us a text. 
We can talk about any of those things. Whatever else might be on your mind, feel free to chime right in at 225-9698. If you're going to be outside the listening area, a couple ways to stay in touch with the show. You can log on to kadsam.com or download the app. The app has it all. It's got all the radio. It's got the Penny News. Brand new edition of the Penny News is on the website right now, thepennynews.com. You can also go pick up a free copy of the Penny News at your favorite local newsstand. Big Elk and Paragon TV on the air tomorrow night with high school football. We're inching ever so close to that being the case for the high school basketball floor. I'm going to guess a week from Friday we've got basketball on there as well. And, of course, the Skinny on Sports podcast is available, and it will be today. I remember to hit the record button without Jared in the seat across from me, so we will have a podcast today. That's always a great accomplishment in my mind for me when I remember to do that as the show starts. So the Skinny on Sports podcast, man, you can find it everywhere, kadsam.com, but everywhere where you find podcasts, we are there as well. All right, so last night the Oklahoma City Thunder opened uh, what is an intriguing season a lot of different – I don't know if there's just like wild swings of opinion on the Thunder. I think most people think they'll be pretty good. But the degree of good, I think, is where you start to see some differing of opinion. Does pretty good mean <clears throat> kind of where they were last year? A, a bit of a surprise with the amount of games that Oklahoma City won last year at 40 and 42 for a team that most thought were still kind of in tank mode. And so is that going to be – does that mean a, a play-in game? Does that mean just outside the play-in game a little bit work because of the how much better the e, or the West, excuse me, the seems to be, or is it fighting for a top six spot and, and a place in the playoffs and not having to worry about the play-in tournament? I think there's a, there's a wide variety of opinions there, but so far so good. Last night Oklahoma City was fantastic. A little bit of a struggle on the defensive end in the first half giving up 35 in the first quarter, 55 at halftime. But the Thunder kind of tightened the screws to the Bulls and pulled away, outscored them 63-49 to in the second half to win and and really dominated from the second quarter on. 124-104 on the road, so the Thunder go to 1-0 with a 20-point win in Chicago. Guys continue to seemingly get better. I mean, it's Shea Gilgis-Alexander opens the season. With 31 points on 12 of 18 shooting, it's a, as, effic- as efficient as you can get. What are the if there is a knock on SGA's game? It's what about shooting threes? What what about from behind the arc? Build that into his game. Two of five last night, and I think if you could get 40 percent from the season on five attempts from Shea Gilgis Alexander, he's going to average over 30 because people are going to have to come out on him, and he we we know what he can do getting into the paint, getting to the rim, and even from the mid-range game as well, and putting points up. Assists last night, he had 10 of them. And so, you know, it, I wonder if we are – if we take take for granted just exactly what SGA is because we get to see him on a nightly basis. Because it, because it does feel like if if you listen locally – the opinions are, yeah, he's probably a top five top, or a top ten guy, for sure top 15. I, I think he's viewed maybe a little bit better than that from a national perspective versus just right here at home. But that guy just continues to be the, the crown jewel of what was an unbelievable trade back when they when they shipped Paul George out to, out to L.A. It's just uh, – it's incredible. Uh, on the text line, they think they should go all out to win. It's been like five seasons. No, it hasn't. There was two obvious tanking seasons and then last year. I mean, it feels like that. There's no doubt because who wants to watch a team win 22 games a year? Nobody. <clears throat> but at the same time, uh, you know, it, it, it's an interesting dilemma moving forward. Because if these guys are as good as, as what people can think, and when it, you know you think of with those four main cogs, it feels like with Giddy, Jalen Williams, SGA, and Chet, where's the money coming from to fill out the roster? <clears throat> it's a great question. I don't know. And that's where the idea of bundling four or five picks for another player 
while in theory, while in a vacuum, while on your fantasy basketball team seems like a great idea, you're going to have to figure out a way to fill this roster out with cheap labor, and obviously you'd want it to be very good cheap labor. And maybe that's where some of those picks come in. Uh, the value of filling out the roster with, with first-round picks outweighs – shipping a bunch of them out. I, I know that we I know that we all believe you can't draft a player for every one of those picks that Sam Presti has amassed. I, I think that's more than obvious. But I also do believe that there's going to be – I mean, I, I think you might be seeing the beginnings of it right now. And I, and I get it. It's one game, and it's hard not to overreact when, it, when a team plays as well as they did last night. But, for instance, if Kaysan Wallace can, can show – consistently what he did last night there's an obvious replacement for Lou Dort's money instead of paying somebody 17 to 20 million dollars over the next few years to do what Lou Dort's doing he can pay Kaysan Wallace a quarter of that to do what Lou Dort's doing or 80 percent of what Lou Dort's doing and then yeah now you free some money up to maybe do do something else but I, I think it's as exciting as it is and, and as exciting as it's going to be as this young core. I mean, this is the first game that we've seen all four of those guys play. There's still going to have to be some learning. There's still going to have to be, and nobody wants to hear this, developing to figure out exactly what they are and what is needed. And I think the lessons that Sam Presti and the organization We'll see what they learned from the first time they had almost this exact same predicament with four guys, two of which you felt like were guaranteed parts. Then it was it was Russ and KD. Now it feels like it's SGA and Chet. Within those two other guys, J Dub and and uh, and Giddy. Now it was Serge and, and James Harden back then. I think it's easier now than it was then for a smaller market team to keep all four. But it's going to be a challenge. And then as you pay all those guys, whatever money you got to pay them, then how can you fill the roster out in a spot that historically cannot acquire players through free agency? It's either trade or it's draft. And so I, I know, especially if the Thunder really take off here in the early part of the season, uh, that what, what, on the text line it's going to be everyone. Let's go, let's go, let's win, let's win now. And, and while true, I don't think it's going to be some sort of accelerated process that gets Oklahoma City to there. It's going to be a little bit slower than I think a lot of people are going to want because it does feel like this team, the pieces, you know, outside of maybe, you know, Giddy and, and SGA being on the floor at the same time and, and kind of both needing the ball in their hands, outside of that, the pieces fit remarkably well. And uh, both of those guys are able to play off the ball. I think both of those guys are probably better with it in their hands. That way they can create for themselves or for other players. But it's uh, it's probably a pretty good, pretty good problem to have when you get when you when you look good enough as as a team this young again. It's so reminiscent of the last time. But good night, uh, Giddy and J Dub were both very very good. I think the one thing that's worth watching throughout the season. And it's it'll be a way for for Josh Giddy to expand his game and improve his game and, and quite frankly improve his value. We'll be getting to the free throw line, and last night he did not get there. You know, a guy that size with that with that skill, he needs to be at the free throw line. And the Thunder didn't shoot a ton; only eighteen free throws as a team. But you, know, you look at Isaiah Joe, and he's he, he's basically a catch and shoot three and D type guy. And he takes four free throws, and Josh Giddy, a guy that has the ball in his hands all the time, doesn't take one. I think that's that's something to watch, and something that can probably be monitored in a way to a way to be able to kind of quantify his growth throughout the season. Is is how many free throws, how how much contact he can absorb, how how he can learn to create free throw opportunities for himself when he gets to the paint. 
Yeah, rim protection. That's that's the obvious the obvious need. But I don't think you're going to see you know, you hear the name Steven Adams bandied about, or a player like Steven Adams to fill into this Thunder roster as something that they're needed. Rim protection is needed. A big guy down low is needed. But I, I think you're seeing the vision of what Sam Presti and maybe what he learned from the last time, and that is you're not you're not going to see some big, giant, stiff standing in the lane on offense. That's That's the last thing that this team needs is to clog things up. And, and I think when you look before, it was the exact same way. You didn't while, – while you probably needed – you needed Kendrick Perkins defensively to be able to bang with some of the guys that were in the league at the time, he was absolutely in the way on offense. And it allowed teams to be able to guard Durant and, and Westbrook in a way without – basically one guy could guard two people. As they tried to get into the lane, try to get to the rim. I don't. You're not. I don't think you're going to see some guy that's in the way like that. It's going to be. I think it's more of the, you know, the Serge Ibaka type guy. You see that with even Chet. Chet's going to block shots, but Chet's not going to block shots with some guy backing him down and then him just stuffing him at the rim. That's not what he's about. And I don't know that you're ever going. I don't know if you're ever going to see. At least while the game's played the way it is right now. I don't know that you're going to see the Thunder have a guy like that. And if you do, it's going to be almost matchup specific. Like, okay, Carl Anthony Towns and Rudy Gobert are on the floor for Minnesota tonight. All right, big guy, you're you're doing it. You know, certain matchups maybe warrant that, but I just don't I don't think with the style that the Thunder has, has committed to offensively and it's that it's what's what everybody's doing golden state mastered it you know five out move the ball cut here cut there keep the lane open for drivers for cutters and having a big guy you know it works on defense sure protecting the rim and that's that's the obvious concern for this team in my mind moving forward is being able to protect the rim in the playoffs there's no doubt about that but it's going to take it's going to take a certain type of guy, though. It's going to take a certain type of guy, and that's that's the problem. Who's out there? It, you know, there's there's a bunch of stiffs, but who can be out there to be able to to kind of play that role? You know, I think you see, I think you saw it last night in Boston. A guy, poor Zingas, is a perfect guy like that. And I think maybe you hope that may, that that Chet grows into that, but he's not that yet. He's just he's not strong enough, lower body wise, to be able to hang with guys backing him down. Whereas Porzingis has turned himself into that. But it, Porzingis has also been in the league for a long time. But that's the type of guy in my mind that you're going to be looking for from Sam Presti. I mean, you know, Jokic is a, obviously not ain't happening here, but you know, someone in that mold that is skilled enough offensively to not just have to stand on the block and get in the way, but also big enough and strong enough to, to make a difference at the rim on the defensive end. That, that's what you're looking for. And, and I, I don't know that there's some sort of quick fix to that. And I also think that the Thunder want to see what they've got. I mean, like I said, it's just one game with all four of these guys on the floor <clears throat> at the same time due to Chet not being able to play last year. So I think, I think, as much fun as it looks like it might be, uh, you know, after last night, they're still going to be. Uh, I think the Thunder are in the position to be, and still will be very patient, very very patient, because not only is it uh, their guys kind of growing up together and and learning and and becoming a team together and, and aging together, there's also at some point. If you look around the West, especially in two or three years, the the teams at the top, they're going to be getting even older. I mean, heck, Golden State's old, Phoenix is old, the Clippers are old, and the Lakers are old. You know, those teams will be coming down as the Thunder's elevator's going up. So I think everyone, as exciting as it's going to be, uh, everyone's still got to remember patience is, is, is a virtue. 
And I don't think you're going to see some wild swing by Oklahoma City right this second to try to improve to a place that maybe still isn't winning a title. On the other side of the court, man, Billy Donovan, not looking good for that that poor guy. Already a players-only meeting after game one. He walked in the locker room and they asked him to uh, to step out to discuss, you know, what they're what they're doing. They brought back their top seven guys from last year. You got to think that getting beat by by twenty on your home floor isn't the way they wanted to start with a veteran laden team. So that I think that's a situation here in the first ten fifteen games. Former Thunder coach Billy Donovan. <clears throat> that could be if that if that thing doesn't start well, you know, if they're three and twelve or. Four and eleven, something like that. Uh, if there's, I need to look that up. But the odd, first coach fired odds, I think Billy Donovan would almost have to be at the top of that list. I mentioned uh, Christoph Porzingis around the league. He was awesome last night in the Boston, uh, Boston down in the Madison Square Garden. A back and forth game. Felt like Boston was about to pull away, and the next thing you know, the Knicks would be right there. And the Knicks did it. Stayed right with what a lot of people think is the favorite to come out of the East. And they did it without their two main guys pl- shooting the ball any good whatsoever. Um, Randall and Brunson combined at 11 for 43. I mean, their point totals are uh, 29. They scored 29 points on 43 shots. But the Knicks were right there. Quickly was great. Um, R.J. Barrett was great. Quentin Grimes hit some big threes down the stretch, but on the Boston side, Porzingis, 5 of 9 from 3, blocked 4 shots, 8 rebounds, made clutch free throws. Uh, You know, you talk about it all the time in high school games or junior high games or whatever, but you look at the free throw line, both teams went the exact same amount of times, and Boston outscored New York by 8. 22 of 26 for the Celts, 14 of 26 for the Dicks. That is putrid free throw shooting. Julius Rander was a big part of that, one of five. So just a tough night shooting for the Knicks. Probably encouraging if you're if you're the Knicks to stay with Boston like that without your guys playing. But man, poor Zingas, does he not look? He looks just what the doctor ordered as a an upgrade from Al Horford from last year. Even Horford made some threes coming off the bench, but boy, poor Zingas on both ends. Sure seems like a perfect fit into what Boston is doing, as does Drew Holiday. The Boston team is very, very good. Very good. And they'll be a they'll be a force in the East, there's no doubt. And then of course Victor Wimbanyama, who all watched. I I made it appointment television. Felt like you had to be in front of the TV to watch Victor Wimbanyama's first NBA game. 15 points, scored a bunch of them in the fourth quarter. But you can just, man, when he's out there, his length is so almost shocking, even on the NBA floor. There was a play where Luka kind of went down the baseline, got stopped at the block. Women Yama was there to help, and it was it was like, I mean, he had his flailing his arms and his legs to try to – keep the pass from going outside to, to Tim Hardaway Jr. It eventually did, and he made a three. But, man, when he was he was just all over. And he was trying to figure out, do his arms go from, like, the baseline to the free throw line? Is that the amount of space that he is able to take up? It's what it looked like. It looked like if he, his pinky would touch the baseline and the other – or his middle finger – tip would touch the baseline and the other would touch like the free throw line or maybe further it just it was amazing to see just the link that he has he's going to be an, a force on defense especially coming from the weak side it, it just he just gets to shots and he gets to spaces with his length that you just don't know that he's going to get there too and, and he's a work in, in progress too body wise he doesn't look as frail as what I thought he would in a lot of ways, um, out there next to the other guys. But the skill is obvious. The length is obvious. Um, it's probably a little much to have his stat line on the screen the entire time underneath the score when he was on the floor. But listen, uh, this is a it's a prospect, an excitement for a prospect, prospect that we haven't seen since, like, LeBron. So there's going to be Victor Wimbanyama shoved down your throat and we'll see how he lives up to the expectations 
and the and the possibilities. But man, it's just it's kind of shocking to see his length out there on the NBA floor just being that noticeable above those other other great athletes. And you can see why. I mean, the tools are there. Just a matter of putting putting it all together for that guy to be a phenomenal, phenomenal player. So we'll see how that that goes. And then tonight, finally get to see um, Dame Lillard in a Milwaukee Bucks uniform. Season opener for the Milwaukee Bucks in Philly. Philly's in turmoil. Harden, they're, they're, I just I have no idea. If you're Joel Embiid, what are you doing right now? And and why isn't Daryl Morey asking him what he wants him to do? Feels like Philly would probably be better off without Harden even showing up. Just kind of send him home until they can find something to do with him. Uh, but what it should be still Embiid versus Giannis, Tyrese Maxey, and and Dame Lillard. We get a fir- our first glimpse of maybe what the Milwaukee Bucks can be tonight. So we'll see. Okay, see, so oh, yeah, yeah, I'd love to have Embiid, but the uh, there's no way in the world the Sixers are picking James Harden over Joel Embiid. Harden will be the one shipped off somewhere, and we'll see where that ends up being. And then we get KD and LeBron for the first time in like five years. They're actually going to play on the same floor tonight. So that'll be fun on the nightcap on TNT. Good start for the NBA, even though it should be Christmas Day when the NBA season starts. It's not, and so here we are talking about it toward the end of October. Hanging out here solo on a Thursday morning ahead of week nine of the high school football season. We'll talk a whole bunch about that tomorrow. The Elks with a chance to nail down second place in the district. Be able to host a playoff game here in a couple of weeks right here at Big Elk Stadium. Big game in Class B's District 1 with Turpin and Laverne. A couple of undefeated teams that will go at it for the B1 district title. There's big games at 4A all across the state, too. 4A2, the district that the 4A1 teams, Elk City, Clinton, Weatherford, that they'll match up with. They've got two huge games, Blanchard and Bethany. If the Lions are able to take care of the Broncos, Blanchard would be the 4A2 district champion. Bethany still with the game against Newcastle next week to get out of that fourth spot and having to go to Clinton more than likely. And then Tuttle and, Tuttle and Newcastle's this week as well. So big games coming up in 4A2 in the last couple of weeks. That'll that'll clear the playoff picture. Not only Friday night, but then for sure next Friday night. Also in 4A1, kind of got the order pretty well established outside of that fourth spot, Chickasha and Cash. That game will happen next week, week 10. Winner will go to the playoffs. They're in 4A1. So that's what we got coming up on tomorrow's show. All right. We've hit a little bit about the Michigan scandal. Oh, wait, wait. Before I get to that, I've got a, I've got a trivia question on, on the line. So the Rangers preseason, the Texas Rangers were 50-1 to to win the World Series. The Arizona Diamondbacks were 125-1. to Question on the on the text line is this: When was the last World Series where both teams were fifty to one or worse entering the season? The last World Series between teams that were fifty to one odds or worse entering the season. It's happening this year for the first time in how many years? Who was playing in it when it went, when was it? That's your question on the text line all right the Jim Harbaugh stuff the Michigan stuff it just seems to get crazier each and every day more revelations coming out into some of the things that Jim Harbaugh was doing or that staffers on Jim Harbaugh's staff were doing I guess we can't really say Harbaugh because there to this point there is zero connection directly between Jim Harbaugh 
any there, there's no evidence of it yet outside of oh you know Jim Harbaugh is the head coach of the Michigan Wolverines but yesterday even a little bit more more allegations it started out that Colin Stallions was just heading to Big Ten games. Now all of a sudden, there he's down in the SEC. He's out in the Pac-12. Basically, all around the country, that you see different things popping up with pictures. That, there's actually pictures. Uh, Connor, not Colin. Connor Stallions, of him actually with his iPhone out, aimed at the the sideline at Oregon-Washington game. So so I I think we're probably past the point of whether or not this actually occurred. And I also think we're probably past the point of whether or not it's legal or illegal. It's clearly illegal, especially if the money to purchase these tickets and and the airfare and the lodging and the food and whatnot was coming from Michigan. We know they were paying him. So maybe there's an that, that's an indirect link and they weren't actually, you know, he wasn't turning in expense reports. We don't know for sure if that was happening. If it was, then obviously Michigan was, was financing these trips. If they were paying him back to go do these things. So uh, <clears throat> I think we're past the point of whether or not it happened. I think we need to start talking about what should happen. And that's an interesting, interesting question. The NCAA, there's part... One of, the, one of the big things about the NCAA right now is it doesn't feel like they have any power. It doesn't it doesn't seem like they're involved in hardly anything outside of the the basketball tournament that they put on every year. And it and it doesn't feel like unless one of the schools out of the goodness of their own heart, OSU basketball, even complies with any of the investigations that they're doing. We, we literally just saw that with Kansas stonewalling at every turn and getting the smallest slap on the wrist of all time, whereas OSU did nothing like what KU is not only accused of, but there's evidence for. But the mistake OSU made was they, they complied. They they turned over information which nobody else is doing. And so when the first immediate reaction of it is, oh, this is the NCAA's chance to really to really get back in the game. This is the NCAA's chance to to prove that they still matter. Well, then that leads us to another problem. Even when the NCAA did have enforcement power, did have investigative chops. The biggest complaint even then was, well, that's great, but by the time something happens, the penalties are against people that weren't even there to to cause the, the issue. Players and maybe even coaches. And so the idea that the NCAA is going to conduct a three-week investigation and have something to do with Michigan's fate this year, I think it's that that's pipe dream. Completely and utterly a pipe dream. So now what can happen? If you're, if you're looking for punishment for Jim Harbaugh and the Michigan team right now, how does that look? What does that look like? How does that happen? And I think there's only one way it can happen. And that is the Big Ten Conference themselves stepping in 
and making a decision to either ban them from the Big Ten title game, suspend Jim Harbaugh. It would be something like that. And then if, let's say, Michigan was banned from the Big Ten title game, well, if they still play all their games and they still beat Ohio State at home and win at Penn State, does that exclude them from the playoff? The, the, the playoff committee is completely unattached to the Big Ten Conference. And would the Big Ten Conference dare do something like that with the money it could cost them if Michigan misses out on the playoff? So that's kind of the, the not do anything to Michigan side for the Big Ten. Uh, yes, yeah, they play Ohio State. Uh, last regular season game, it's that one's in Ann Arbor. Home game for Michigan. They do go to Penn State in a couple of weeks. So, they, yeah, they play – all three of those teams play each other because they're all in the, the east of the Big Ten. So, yes, they absolutely play Ohio State and Penn State. And so that that's kind of the conundrum for the Big Ten. Those games are going to happen. And then – if Michigan were to, to, to be undefeated at the end of the, of the regular season, you know that you're costing yourself a guaranteed spot in the playoff. Having said all that for Michigan, I guarantee you there's 13 other teams in the Big Ten that are pretty upset about this. And so now the conference kind of has to weigh those options. Are you going to do what's what 13 of 14 feel is best from a competitive standpoint, from an ethical standpoint? Or are you going to do what's best well, in your mind for all 14, is that, and that is let Michigan play in the playoff, collect the money off of that, and then disperse it and hope that you know however many millions of dollars that is that each team gets because of the Wolverine success will kind of – Pipe them down just a little bit. Yeah, here you go on the text line. If Ohio State wins, they'll do something to Michigan. If they if Michigan wins, they won't. <laughs> that honestly, that could be the right answer. And who knows who knows what is revealed between now and oh, that game is played November. Mm, can't remember the exact date. About a month from now, so who who knows what comes out between in, in another month before that game is played? Yeah, you know, the twenty fifth, November twenty fifth. So that's what Saturday after Thanksgiving. I I I would tend to believe that the answer to this question would happen before that. I mean, because then at that point, you're talking about having to make a decision to keep them out the week of the Big Ten title game. Which I suppose could happen. If that's the thought right now in the Big Ten offices is, okay, let's let this play out. Hopefully it takes care of itself. Michigan loses to Penn State. Michigan loses to Ohio State. And this is all for naught. And then we can we can hammer them, and it's not going to cost not not going to cost us anything. Probably in a perfect world, that's what happens. I just don't know if that's the way this is going to transpire. Uh, Michigan's on a bye week this week; they don't play again until uh, next Saturday at home against Purdue. But at the same time, I'm sure there's they're a little bit leery of making a decision. And then kind of having their nose rubbed in it with some when, if some other bombshell happens. Text here, a good friend that graduated from Michigan, has season tickets, thinks Harbaugh should be fired if it's proved he did something wrong. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess that I, I don't disagree with that at all. And, and it's not necessarily to me just this. Harbaugh has thumbed his nose at the NCAA for a couple of different things. 
you know this isn't this isn't like strike one from Jim Harbaugh and, and what what he what he's how he's dealt with the NCAA. It's strike two or three. I mean, he didn't coach the first few games of this season because of just blatantly ignoring COVID rules. Now I'm going to blame it on buying a hamburger for a kid. That's not what happened. It's it's ignoring the rules that were established during COVID. Like them or not, they were still rules that that everybody else had to follow. If a rule is broke, should be disciplined the year it was broken. I, if that's at all possible, I would agree. But how do you? It's not the team, the coach. Well, here's my problem with this particular situation. Yeah, the, the team did not necessarily have anything to do with this. But I don't think there's any way we can say the team didn't benefit from this. That's the problem here. It, it's not. You know, a lot of these situations are, you know, a grades here or a player being paid there or whatever it is. This is like on-field performance enhanced because of what was going on with the coaching staff. I, I don't, I don't, I don't see a way to make a distinction between the coach and the team on this one because what the coach was doing was directly affecting the performance of the team. I have a hard time believing anything will really happen unless <coughs> excuse me unless we unless something that hasn't come to light yet comes to light like I said probably before the uh the big ten title game and once again the the, the NCAA isn't doing anything on this because the NCAA doesn't move fast enough at, at least if we're talking about something happening this year to Michigan that keeps them from you know, winning a Big Ten title or, or playing in the playoff, if you're looking for that to happen, then you're looking at the Big Ten Conference. You're not looking at the NCAA. Because the NCAA, there is no chance that they can move this fast on anything. It would have to come from the Big Ten. And so that's kind of what's, what, I guess, what everybody's waited on. You know, and it looks like there was a, the NCAA might have had a law firm <laughs> investigating this. It's wild. The story is long from written. But I think there's at least a a quarter of a chance up to maybe even a half a chance that with what is still yet to come out, that Michigan gets hammered for this bef- this season. And that maybe one of the major storylines coming down the pike as we get ready for the first playoff rankings next week this Michigan story isn't going anywhere in the entirety of that lead up to those conference championship games and, and whether or not Michigan's going to be in it or not, even if they're eligible with having enough uh, enough wins and a, and a good enough record to be there. And then the last thing is, does Harbaugh care? Is he just biding his time and on the phone with Lincoln Riley – trying to decide, okay, you go to Chicago, I'll go to to the Chargers by taking NFL jobs and leaving this mess that he's created back at his alma mater, uh, back at his alma mater, right at their feet. As he sees the posse coming, is he going to exit stage left? It's a lot of questions there. A whole bunch of questions. When we come back, does anybody know the answer to the trivia question? I had a guess. It wasn't right. Question is, when is the last time? The, the World Series is happening this, this year like this. When is the last time the two teams in the World Series was more or 50 to 1 or more to win the World Series in the preseason? Hanging out here on a Thursday, wrapping it up in the last segment. The question on the text line was this. Who... This year's, this year's World Series starts tomorrow between Texas and the Arizona Diamondbacks. Features two teams that were 50-1 to 1 or higher to win the World Series before the season started. Texas was 50-1. to 1, Arizona was 125-1. to 1. Question on the text line is, when was the last time that happened? We've had the same guess. 
a couple of times. Mets, Orioles. <laughs> Here we got a never. No, it has happened. It has happened. Mets, Orioles, 1969. I'm not going to tell you that that wasn't the case back then, but there's been one since then. There has been one since then. I'll give you a couple more minutes to think. I'll give a hint. I'll give a hint. One of the the hint is one of the major players the last time this happened you will hear from during this World Series. Cubs Indians is not it. Cardinals Twins once again could have been but there was one since then. When was the last time we had a World Series where both teams were 50-1 to 1 or worse to win? It's been a while back. Like I said, the, the, the hint is you will hear from one of the major players in that series during this one. We have a winner. We have a winner. That major player in that series was John Smoltz. And the answer is 1991 Braves Twins. The Atlanta Braves going into the 1991 season were 200 to 1 to win the World Series. The Minnesota Twins were 80 to 1 to win the World Series. So Twins, Braves, 1991 was the last time that we've seen what we're going to see Friday down in Arlington with two teams that were at least 50-1 to to win the World Series before the season started to actually make it to the Fall Classic. Kirby Puckett. Yeah, that was, that was back young, that was young skinny days. Young skinny was enamored with the Braves back then. TBS every game, young team, cool team, the Tomahawk chop, whatever, all of it. Kirby Puckett was 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 a uh, he was one of the he was one of the first athletes that Young Skinny really despised, really really despised, and it still baffles the mind all these years later that Bobby Cox had Charlie Liebrandt into close when Kirby Puckett took him deep. And, of course, that spawned the iconic Jack Buck, we'll see you tomorrow night, which then Rangers fans close your ears, but then his son Joe Buck remade that call in 2011, game six, when David Freeze won the game with a home run against Texas. Last time the Rangers were in the World Series. So there you have it. Twins, Braves was the last time there was two teams in the World Series that were kind of this uh, surprising. This is what we're going to see tomorrow night. NFL trade deadline coming up. Man, are, are we really going to see Saquon Barkley or, or Derrick Henry traded? There's a lot of smoke to those guys. Um it seems like people are trying to try and when you look at, at teams that could use a running back or use a really good running back a team that maybe that puts them over the top to kind of spring to the top of the list. One of them right here on the text line, Henry to the bills. I think the bills are the one are one of them. And the other is the Ravens. With what Baltimore did to Detroit the other day, you know Lamar obviously is one of the scariest running quarterbacks we've ever seen in the NFL, and they've just been hurt at the running back position. It seems like kind of snake bit over the last few years. You know Dobbins done for the year again. Justice Hill's been hurt a little bit. Gus Edwards is Gus Edwards, right? I mean, I, I get that there's. 
reasons to and not to do something like this because of the salary cap implications, but it's as far as just making a team better. Those are the two that really feel like are a running back away from really putting them in a position to challenge the Chiefs in the AFC. I, because of the way the running back position has been so devalued, I don't know if either one of them are actually going to pull the trigger on a deal like this. But I, I think Derrick Henry, Derrick Henry makes sense in Buffalo. I think Saquon makes sense in Baltimore. Because of his ability to catch the ball of the backfield, to work with Lamar in that way, kind of maybe even free up. So far, Zay Flowers and and Mark Andrews have been the total focal point of what's going on in the throw game for Lamar. Give him another option out of the backfield. Maybe maybe it it helps Odell, or maybe it helps Bateman, or somebody else. With the eyes having to be on on Saquon, so that, that's something to watch over the next week for as we move up to the NBA trade deadline if one of those superstar running backs is on the move and Saquon Barkley, Derrick Henry. And then also, I think you've got a team out in Denver that is really wanting to – I think they would love for somebody to be dumb enough to take Russell Wilson off their hands and then they wouldn't have to have a fire sale. But since I don't know if there's somebody dumb enough to do that, Lots of really good play. This is kind of like, yeah. I think you could see in 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 Denver, maybe even in Tennessee, the smart teams pick up somebody for pennies on the dollar that could really help make a playoff run and maybe even a Super Bowl run by by poaching somebody off of those two teams that makes sense and fits and. It may not, and it may not be. We saw Bayer yesterday go to Philly. He's been a all. He's, he's been a uh, Pro Bowl safety. So we'll see uh, if 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 something transpires. It the 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 NBA and the, the Major League Baseball trade deadline seem like they're way more involved than what happens in the NFL. NFL trades in my mind happened in the off season leading up to the draft and that kind of thing is is when you really see this and there's just kind of some minor moves here and there. So I don't know that, I don't know there's a reason to expect something crazy, but who knows? Maybe we will. Maybe we will see a a landscape trade, a landscape changing trade at the NFL's trade deadline with one of those two running backs or who knows somebody else that could be on the move. Got Baker and Buffalo tonight. I would imagine that goes very well for the Bucks. In the big games this weekend, Jacksonville goes to Pittsburgh. You know Pittsburgh's been outgained in every game this season, and they're four and two. It's just incredible. The other team hadn't won one yet in Carolina. There's two teams that have been outgained in every game they played. Pittsburgh's four and two. Carolina's zero and six. The Rams come to Dallas. Cleveland at Seattle. We'll talk to Sean at some point. Not playing. P.J. Walker's a starter. I think this is the cautionary tale that the owners have been spinning for years and years about not fully guaranteeing contracts in the NFL. Look what's happening. $240 million guaranteed. Now he's not playing. Even when a few times he's been medically cleared to. Then Cincinnati at San Francisco. 49ers looked invincible on Sunday night football against the Cowboys just a couple of weeks ago now 5 and 2 reeling a two game losing streak and Cincinnati is a team that after starting very very slow looks to have kind of figured things out Chase and Burrow are back kind of on the same page maybe Burrow getting a little bit healthier than what he was with the calf injury coming into the season so there's some good ones there's some duds there's some duds on the night games on the over the weekend but there's some good ones during the day on Sunday in the NFL slate. That'll do it for a Thursday. Hit high school football schedule tomorrow. College football looking ahead to the weekend. Also, the World Series starts tomorrow night down in Arlington. Thanks for listening, everybody. Have a great Thursday. 
It's been the Skinny on Sports right here on the Sports Animal. You've been listening to the Skinny on Sports podcast with Aaron Cow. Be sure to hit that subscribe button to get alerts of when the latest podcast is available. Thanks for listening. That ball is blistered around.